Not long after my daughter started kindergarten, she crawled up onto my lap, she looked me in the eye, and she said, Dad, I really like going to school. You see, <laughs> she had this infectious curiosity that's really typical in most five-year-olds. But from that point forward, I started to see a fire in her that I'd not quite seen before. School was a place that empowered her to lean into that natural curiosity. It was a place that she had access to every day that not only allowed her to find purpose in her learning, but encouraged her to do so. Now, as a teacher, this was a pretty big moment for me. I mean, look at my kindergarten daughter taking full advantage of a free education. I mean, she must be a teacher's kid, right? <laughs> but the more I got to know her friends that year, I realized that her enthusiasm to learn wasn't unique to her. It was actually a trait that most of her classmates shared. These kindergartners' love of school was so remarkable to me, because at the time, I taught 11th and 12th grade English. <laughs> and <laughs> while I suspected that my students had been just as excited to learn when they were five, something had happened to them in the interim, and that fire had all but vanished. Although the best students in our school still manage to enjoy the rigors of their education, many of them are incredibly stressed out, and that has a detrimental effect on their learning. On the other side of the spectrum, the poorest performing students were often the most apathetic. They just didn't care much about the things they were supposed to be learning in school. Other students cared so much about being labeled as a failure that they were afraid to do any work at all to avoid the hit on their self-esteem if they received a poor grade. The more teachers I've talked with around the country, and the more I've read about this problem, I've realized this isn't something isolated to my school district or the state that I teach in. This is a common problem in public education all over the United States. So, what happens to our kids on that journey through the American education system? When does their fire start to go out? That's a huge question with a lot of different possible answers, but I think a commonality among most of them is that somewhere along the way, teachers start using grades to represent their students' progress. So I thought to myself, what would happen if I just stopped using them for a year? I mean, how would that change the experience that my students would have in my class? Well, I'm here to tell you what happened when I did. Because I believe what I've discovered has the potential to completely change the public education system as we know it. It's a key way for us to help put the focus back on the learning for our students. And as it turns out, it's a much more equitable way for all students to access a rigorous education. Several years ago, one of my hardest working students really struggled when it came time to write an essay. Now, he's a great test taker, and he could tell you about all of the minor characters in the books that we read and the things that they did. But when it came time to develop an interpretation about why the story mattered, he had a hard time. This is actually pretty typical for most students subject to the high-stakes nature of our grading system. Social, si social scientists like Dan Pink, Alfie Cohn, Rick Wormley, and John Hattie tell us that when we place these huge incentives on academic performance, it actually causes our students' brains to narrow their focus. You see, they're looking for that one right answer they must have learned at some point during the class. And honestly, this is why my student was such a great test taker. The pressure that he felt to get a good grade actually narrowed his focus and helped him to find that answer. But the research also tells us that putting our students in these high-pressure situations actually has a negative effect on their ability to think critically, to think in creative ways, or to solve complex problems. So when there's more than one possible answer to a question, grades become a roadblock for our students. You see, my students struggled to consider the ambiguous ideas in a text or the nuances of crafting a well-developed essay simply because he was distracted. By the grade, he knew what inevitably come. Sad thing is, I can't really blame him. I mean, our students have so much writing on their grades, it's no wonder they've become more important to them than the learning those grades are supposed to represent. For example, 
most students won't be able to get into the college of their choice without a high enough GPA. Other students won't be able to afford to go to college at all without the help of scholarship money. And of course, many scholarships are awarded to the students with the most impressive transcripts. Parents and teachers are putting all sorts of pressure on their kids to get the best grades or the highest test scores because we want them to have an opportunity to realize their dreams. In some states, students can get their tuition completely paid for at an in-state college if they have a high enough GPA. So, yeah, students do care a lot about their grades. But the problem is, we've developed a system that rewards these good marks so heavily that students have forgotten what school was supposed to be about in the first place. Learning. Later that same year, I started to talk about this problem with one of my students during a planning period of mine. He basically told me that many of the students in our school didn't really care too much about what they were learning, but they were willing to sit through any class that would look good on their transcript, do whatever they needed to do to get that A. The students with the best grades weren't always the best learners or the most gifted. They were just better at playing the game. So over the course of that 90-minute period, my student and I brainstormed the beginnings of a new system that would not only work for me as the teacher, but would allow students to take the focus off their grade and return it to their learning. Instead of feeling the pressure to get a perfect score on every single assignment, students could reflect, which would then inevitably allow them to grow. But the longer we talked about the effect that grades had on students' learning, I realized that they were actually the cause of a lot of other toxic side effects as well. So when I told my classes that I was a little uncomfortable with the way schools typically use grades, and that I was considering a change, I asked them about their experiences. It became all too clear that they were really suffering. They were stressed out. Many of them had anxiety. They were sleep deprived from doing homework late into the night for weeks at a time. Students who couldn't finish all of their work had fallen so far behind that they'd either given up on their classes completely or had resorted to cheating their way through them just to get the grade that they felt they needed. Students who, were who managed to finish their work were so competitive with one another that these long-standing friendships had begun to sour as a result. Perhaps worst of all, the most gifted students in our school were able to slide by doing as little work as possible, which caused resentment among their classmates who had to put in long hours of work just to earn the same grade. I thought to myself, something's got to change. I mean, how can I, a teacher who claims to care about my students and their well-being, continue to perpetuate this failed system? especially after I know firsthand what it is doing to them. The good news is, I don't have to anymore. Turns out there's a better way. Just stop using grades altogether. So as I started to think through the ins and outs of what a gradeless system might look like, my mind jumped to all of the immediate concerns that I knew my students and their parents were going to have. What exactly do you mean you're getting rid of grades? I mean, it sounds good, Mr. Brisbane, but how's this going to affect my GPA? And what are colleges going to think if I'm taking classes that don't actually have grades? These are legitimate concerns. And I knew that if this was going to be embraced by my students and their parents and my administration, that I'd have to design it in a way that didn't impact any post-secondary opportunities. But I also knew that the only thing that colleges looked at was that letter grade next to the course description on the transcript. And I thought to myself, well, I can work with that. I mean, as long as students don't view each individual assignment as this collection of points, then the learning could still be the primary focus for them. So the next year, I sat down in September with my new AP Lit classes, and we had a hard look at the standards and talked about the ways that we would assess their progress towards meeting them. We talked about what they wanted to reflect on that grade that would end up on their transcript at the end of the year. And I asked them to consider what they thought an A-caliber student would do in this class. 
We agreed that I would give them feedback through written, uh, written notes, through whole class mini lessons, and through individualized conferences. But that the real secret to their progress would be in their own reflection on the work that they did and to continually set personalized goals to push them towards proficiency. So after two days of thoughtful reflection and planning, we agreed that the grade that would go on their transcript would be decided upon through a conversation between myself and each individual student. That conversation would revolve around three main criteria regarding their progress that year. Their growth over time, their proficiency to the standard, and their work ethic. Now that my students were more focused on their progress and less hung up on their grade, I started to have so many more authentic conversations with them about their learning. Since a poor performance on an essay no longer meant that they would be penalized for the rest of the year, they viewed these opportunities as a springboard to get feedback on how to improve. This helped me to connect with every student multiple times a semester, and it helped me to build trust with all of them. Instead of a gatekeeper who was judging their work and passing out grades accordingly, I was more of a coach or a mentor, guiding them on their own personal learning journeys. But the real value in the new system came in the day-to-day -day interactions that I noticed with my students. They stopped asking how much an assignment was worth, and they started asking all sorts of wonderful questions that made them naturally curious about the things that they were learning. Rather than playing it safe and sticking to a formula, students were taking risks in their writing. Instead of being afraid to seem too critical when peer editing, students were having informed and in-depth conversations about the nuances in their work that would push them to the next level on their rubric. For the first time, students were experimenting with their writing voice and going out on a limb when developing interpretation and sometimes, they failed spectacularly. <laughs> but I always made sure to celebrate them for taking a chance. Because it's in these intermittent failures that are bound to happen several times a semester that the most important lessons are often learned. Rather than being competitive with one another, we now tracked the collective progress of the class and celebrated as we all grew together. Instead of being jealous of the first student to exceed standard on an essay, the class jumped out of their chairs and cheered. One student, after writing his first proficient essay of the year, was so excited, he put it in a picture frame, wrapped it up, <laughs> gave it back to me as a gift, and it still sits on the bookshelf in my classroom today. Because this wasn't about an individual performance. You see, this was an accomplishment for all of us. And that's when I noticed something else with my students. Their fire to learn magically reappeared. But the most impressive result was in the quick, rapid progress that my students started to make in their work. The ones who began the year as the weakest writers improved exponentially faster than their more skilled classmates. Sure, they had a lot more room to improve, but this also meant that Getting rid of grades was most beneficial for the students who would have typically struggled in an AP class. And that was when I realized that a gradeless system is much more equitable for all students. This isn't something that just benefits the most gifted or those who have learned how to play the game. In fact, it's one way that we can include students in these academic opportunities that many of them have felt themselves incapable of before. But don't just take my word for it. My students left so many wonderful comments on their end-of-the-year survey, talking about things like feeling less stressed, actually enjoying the things that they were learning about, and admiring the progress that they made throughout the course of the year. But there was one that really stood out to me, and it's representative of many of the things that my students had, had to say. The question that I asked was, how has a gradeless system changed you in a learner, as a learner? My student wrote, it makes me responsible for my education. I almost feel more guilty if I miss an assignment or don't do well on an essay because I feel the system is fair to me. So I need to respect and be fair back to it. 
In other classes, it's easy to cheat or skip assignments because it feels like the system is against me and it's my only job to get a grade at whatever cost necessary. This new gradeless system makes me a little uncomfortable because it doesn't allow me to hack the program just for the grade. And it's not me versus the system because I am the system. I recognize that this discomfort is beneficial and encourages me to grow more than a 100 point scale. You can clap for that. <laughs> yeah. This year, I've taken the system that I piloted last year and have implemented it in all of my classes. It works just as well for my sophomore English class as it did with my senior AP kids. I'm also happy to report that this is something that's gaining traction, not just in our school, but around the world. The more I've researched the idea of de-emphasizing grades, I've connected with this whole community of teachers around the world who are playing with these same ideas in their classes as well. It's a current in education that's just now starting to gain momentum, and it makes me really excited for what the future of education might hold. I want to end with a quote by Albert Einstein, who I think many of us agree is like the smartest person to have ever lived. <laughs> Seemed like a good one to consult. He said, the world as we have created it is a process of our thinking. It cannot be changed without changing our thinking. If you, in whatever your role, maybe as a teacher or an administrator, maybe just as a parent or a grandparent, would like to see the next generation of students learn with purpose and intention and to do it together as a community, then it's time for us to start fundamentally changing the way we think about grades in schools. I don't want to see the fire in my daughter's eyes go out as she grows up. I want my high school students to love learning again. So if you have a stake in the education world, big or small, then it's time for us to start these conversations. It's time to get rid of grades. Thank you.